Amen. Well, this morning, uh, we've had a few glitches, but uh, as usual, the Lord's going to have his way. So we don't have to be concerned. We don't have to be in a state of panic or, you know, anything else. Let me just ask you as you're listening, um, who is the Lord? Who is God? Is he not the same yesterday, today, and forever? He is not going to let the enemy defeat him. He has the enemy in his hands. Um, he allows them to do things or not do things. Uh, Job experienced a lot of rough times, but Satan was in uh, in God's control, and he didn't allow uh, didn't allow Satan to kill him. Um, but all the things that Job experienced did nothing more than bring honor and glory to God. So. When we experience problems and hassles and uh, what looks to be uh, death around the corner, God is always in the control. So, you know, even at our darkest moments, that's when we need to trust the Lord the most and know that he is not going to let anything happen that's not in his plans. So let's read this. Let's read chapter uh, 59, knowing that God is in control. It says, deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Let's, looking at that verse, we have to um, understand that, yes, we're going, to have, we're going to have enemies. We're going to have people that we're, are going to come against us. We have situations that, uh, that will affect our monies, our health, uh, our home, our loved ones, uh, but but are we are we so concerned with the things that are happening that we take our eyes off God? Uh, no, and in many respects, things happen like that to bring us back to God. It would seem that we are weak and defeated and are experiencing all these issues because of the fact we're sinners. Well, that's not the case. It's, it's to be able to show us that in whatever circumstances we're in, and I mean every circumstance, that God is God. He is in complete control. Whether we call them enemies or our friends or neighbors, whatever the situation may be where uh, people say or do things that may cause us grief or may cause us problems, the most important thing is what we're going to do with that. Are we going to take it to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't handle this situation. I need you to step in and take it. Or are we going to, you know, uh, wring our hands like the Bible says and, and go, oh, woe is me. I'm, I'm going to be defeated again today. And that is what God is trying to prevent us from doing. He is trying to mature us, trying to grow us up in the, in the Word of God, so that as we hear the Word of God, as we read the Word of God, the things that seem to be, and I mean seem because it's, it's not necessarily true, it just seems that way, that um, when the enemy tries to attack us, it's it's a lost cause for him. The, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is already the victor over the enemy itself. And it's just that in our head, in our mind, in our will, our emotions, we need to start to understand that it doesn't make a difference what the circumstances uh, prove to be. They're, it's only a shadow. If we remember in Psalms 23, uh, the one, you know, where David's talking about uh, he, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, in that, one of the verses states that, uh, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Well, specifically, it, the wording says, the shadow of death. The, the verse doesn't say, yea, though I walk to death, the valley of death. It's the shadow of death. In other words, 
all the things that presently come to our mind when we're having hard times is we we're, we say to ourselves, holy cow, the, you know, death is right around the corner. No, it's a shadow. It's nothing more than just darkness that we have to walk through. And we walk through it with our Savior who is taking us by the hand and is leading us. So as we continue to read these verses, let's understand that the things that we go through are not a mystery to God. God understands perfectly what's going to happen to us, and he's waiting for us to lean on him and to know that he is a God over every situation. In verse 2, it says, Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. Save me from bloody men. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. This this, uh, psalm is being uh, written while David is having a direct conflict with the king, Saul, who is out to kill him. Saul doesn't have, he is so controlled at different times to the point where he is a complete basket case. He has no control over his mind, will, emotions. He, is, he throws, he threw a spear at David to kill him. Um, he is sending his army after David, and he is doing whatever he can to kill, quote, his enemy. So David is his enemy. But, but David never looks at Saul as any more than the king that God has established to do the right thing in Israel. It's just that Saul was messed up. Saul had problems. Saul was um, driven by demons to do things because of his own sin, because of the fact that he went to uh, a witch to get information on how to act and how to do things. Um, so the the complexity in the situation between David and Saul is an ongoing issue through through the Psalms, and it drives David to continually come before the Lord and say, Lord, I've got an enemy that he's trying to kill me, he's trying to do this, trying to do that, and as he's as he has to continually deal with the situation of Saul, what does that do? It drives David to the Lord. And fortunately, we have an example for us to know that no matter what the situation is, no matter what the enemy is, we need to come to the Lord. We don't need to take this upon ourselves and say, Oh, I've got to figure out what to do now. How am I going to handle this? This guy is, it's a spiritual problem, so how am I going to deal with this? No, it's the fact that Christ, God has already dealt with the situation. It's just that we don't know it because it hasn't happened timeline-wise. It hasn't occurred. And so since it hasn't occurred, we look at it as future event that's going to destroy us, when in God's eyes, it's already past. We, he lives past, present, and future. We, I, I know this may be a little difficult to understand, but we are already in heaven with Christ in the future. God has already placed us. We, we have our heavenly mansion room in heaven that we are, where we are going to dwell forever. Brothers and sisters, we are overcomers, not just in the lightest sense, but absolutely in the entirety of it. We have a place that's already seated with God, with Christ and the Holy Spirit in the heavenlies forever and ever and ever. And to let something come against and come between our relying on God to be able to minister to our daily problems and our daily needs is ridiculous. It's a waste of our effort, a waste of our time. We are more concerned with with the problems involved than we are with serving our God. We are servants. We are made to be servants. And that means that 
no matter what happens, we come to the master and we say, okay, master, how do I resolve this? What do I do? I come to you and I'm asking you, Father, to help me through this problem. So now that I've asked you, I'm going to sit back and relax and know that you've got it under hand. I'm not going to let it affect me anymore. I'm not going to let it affect my confidence in you, Father. I'm going to be strong in you, and I'm going to keep going forward with you. And therefore, I am the victor in your strength, not my own. So it says in verse 4, they run and prepare themselves without my fault. Awake to help me, and behold, thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen, be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Pause. Now, at that time, the grace of God through the salvation of Jesus Christ wasn't, hadn't been given yet. So at that time, God dealt a lot h- harsher with transgressors and those who were sinful and those who were in a uh, in a wicked place in their lives where they uh, served uh, Moloch and other gods of of the um, of the surrounding peoples surrounding Israel and and bringing uh, problems on them. He dealt harsher with them than than today because there wasn't any grace given at that point in the sense of an overall uh, ministry to all the people of the earth. It was the grace was intended to be given, but it hadn't been given to, to that point. There were certainly examples of grace given to specific people where God chose to minister grace to certain people. And you might say, well, who would that be? Well, let's take Nebuchadnezzar, for example. Nebuchadnezzar was one of the most vile, hateful, murderous, killing uh, kings in history. He was absolutely violent. There was nothing that would prevent him from doing what any, whatever he chose to, whatever he wanted to, at any time given. That, that was just absolute uh, anger and rage in the man. He just took three three young Israelites who wouldn't serve him and do what they wanted and threw them into a fiery furnace, figuring that he was going to burn them up. Not caring for how horrible and how hateful that that was, he didn't care. And yet God, in his mercy, got a hold of, of Nebuchadnezzar, spoke to him, and finally... At the end, after seven years of running around with uh, hair like an animal and claws, fingernails uh, grown out like claws, and eating eating grass out in the field for seven years, it says that God brought him back to his right mind, and he said, there is a God, and that God is the God of Israel, and I'm going to worship him. He knew it took seven years, but he knew that uh, that God existed, God was real. And so was that grace? It didn't look like grace for seven years, it, running around looking like an animal. But in the end, it was very graceful. It was very merciful. And God, God instead of killing him like he uh, probably could have, had he chosen to and taken his life and made a new king, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to get saved, to, to actually, and he'll be in heaven. You can ask him all about it when you, we get there. So that's for the future, though. Uh, <clears throat> verse 6, they return at e- evening, they make a noise like a dog, and go around about the city. You ever heard a, no- uh, a dog make a noise when, uh, even when you can't hear anything, they'll howl and bark and raise all sorts of ruckus because of the fact that that something's going on. Now, we may not hear it. We may not hear the, the sound pitter-patter of a squirrel on our roof of our house, but the dog hears it, and the dog will raise a ruckus. And that's what he's referring to when he's talking about this with the people. They go around making a big noise. There's nothing happening, of course. But they'll go around making a noise, and they'll, they'll create a big, uh, big stink, 
and we're trying to figure out what in the world they're barking at. And there's nothing they're, they're barking at that, that's of any concern. They're just barking. They're just making noise. And that's what our enemies do. They make a lot of noise for us, and they create a lot of situations and a lot of circumstances that we are concerned for all the noise when, when what are we doing? We're wasting our time. Let's just go before and get on our knees and go before our God, lift it up to the Lord, and in our peace and in our rest of the Holy Spirit, we can just say, Lord, they're making a lot of noise again. Uh, can you please help me get through this? And God says, okay, yeah, let's let's go through this together. Seven, behold, they belch out with their mouths, swords are in their lips. For who, say they, doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shall laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. What a, what a magnificent verse. If we want to memorize a verse, let's, let's memorize this so that when we end up having a problem or problems or multitude of problems or whatever it may be that the enemy throws at us, that we can look up and say, Thou, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You know, because God looks at it, and it doesn't make any difference what these people do, folks. It's going to be over for them soon. Very soon and very uh, and quickly, Lord's going to take care of this and just laugh at them because everything they're doing is just a complete waste of time. There's nothing they can do that's a permanent situation. Job, all the problems that came on him were only temporary. He didn't see it at the moment as being temporary, but God looked down at it as at the end. And the end was that that Job was in a position of being an authority over all the problems that were surrounding him. It's just that he didn't see it yet, and we don't see it yet. We're, happy, it, we're coming up to it, and it's directly in front of our face, but to God, it's behind us already. So that's why we need to realize that the heathen are in derision. They're all confused. Why do you think we pray for uh, a prayer of warfare in the, in every morning? Because we put them in derision by doing that. We confuse them. We break their plans. And by the way, all the demons' plans today are broken. We break it with the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come against all the enemy and command them in Jesus' name to be confused and ask Lord to go in there and break their plans, pour confusion on them so that they can't do anything, cause them to be in derision. And see, it's simple as that. That's all we have to do. That's all we have to pray is the very words of God to put them on on their heels and make them uh, be afraid. Because they're afraid, folks. When they see the angels of God coming down and causing problems for them and for the people that are causing problems for us, and he sends his angels, his ministering spirits to minister, let me tell you, we may not see it, but in the heavenlies they see it, and they see what's going on. And we will see it in the future when when all this is played back for us. And we're going to realize that God, God had everything in hand. Nothing was out of his sight or out of his ability to handle the situation. Verse 9, because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. What a wonderful verse that is, because it's, it is the strength that we have knowing that God is our defense. The God, in verse 10, the God of my mercy shall prevent me. God shall let me see my desire upon my enemies. Today, because of grace and mercy, the, the um, verse that we see, this, my, my desire upon my enemies, should be salvation. We should be praying for salvation for the people around us. Why? Because God can save them. Grace is for today. So if we have problems with, quote, enemies, let, let's pray for them so that they wouldn't be our enemies and they'd be our brothers and sisters. 
God can do it because of his grace and mercy. He has allowed his Holy Spirit to be in the world today. Jesus, when he left, he sent my he sent him his Holy Spirit to come and be with us, and not just for us, but everybody. Everybody in this world can be affected and ministered to through by the Holy Spirit and is trying to minister salvation to everyone. All they have to do is receive it. Did you hear that? All they have to do is receive it. Sometimes they don't receive it because you haven't and I haven't prayed for them. We haven't talked to them about salvation. We haven't had the opportunity, whether it's being the weakness of our flesh or weakness in our of who and what we are in our soul. We haven't had the, the guts to talk to somebody who looks to be an enemy about Jesus. Sometimes it's just that their their heartache is so great that they don't understand the peace and rest that comes through Christ. And it might be just us ministering to them in peace and grace that would change that for them, and then they'd no longer be an enemy. So we, we need to understand that today my desire upon my enemies should be grace and mercy. Slay them not, lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for cursing and lying which they speak. Does that bring us to to be remindful of the things that we actually come in contact with? Where it says pride and for cursing and for lying which they speak. Is this not demons? Is this not fallen angels that are causing problems and living in people? And so all they know how to do is to curse and to show pride and to be in anger and cause wrath to those around them. See, folks, in verse in Ephesians 6, where it says, For we wrestle not against uh, flesh and blood. That's enemies. That's our physical enemies. But we wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers, uh, and and that's a spiritual warfare. That's why it talks about putting on the armor of God. I bet very few of us have prayed that prayer and asked God to help us put on the salvation, uh, the helmet of salvation today, or we have failed to put on the breastplate of righteousness today, or we have failed to pull on uh, uh, and been shod with the gospel. There's there's so many things that we should be doing every day in order to protect us and strengthen us so that we can come against the enemy, which is the the spirits, and not the people around us. The people are not our enemies. It's the angelic host, the fallen ones that have caused the problems. They live in everybody we know, everybody we uh, deal with on a daily basis. And unless we can come to the conclusion that it's because of our weakness in doing the things that God has shown us to do, that's why we're having as many problems as we're having. It's time to recognize in ourselves what's weak, what's missing, and to take hold of that and put it before the Lord and say, obviously, Lord, I haven't done what I'm supposed to do, So let me do the things necessary in order to be victorious over the enemy today, over my spiritual enemy. That in itself will give us the strength to be able to go forward. In verse 13, it says, consume them in wrath. Consume them. Well, the consuming should be the burning up and the taking uh, taking authority over should be what's coming against the angelic host, the demons that are causing problems that they may not be, and let them know that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. Pause. Let's pause. Let's think about this. To the ends of the earth. In other words, God is in control. Let us verbalize the fact that we understand that God is in charge of the spiritual realm he is going to come against the enemy as directed, as asked, as pleaded with, and he's going to cause our enemy to be in derision. 
He's going to cause them to be confused. He's going to cause them to um, fail in their plans. And therefore, we are going to be victorious. He wants that victory for us, but it takes us recognizing it and putting those issues before our God. And at evening, let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. In other words, it doesn't make it any difference. They're going to do it anyways. They're going to be they're going to be acting like the animals that they are. They're going to be, they are in control by the by the fallen angels, and they are going to uh, do stupid things, and they are going to be loud and boisterous and and cursing and swearing and and making problems for us and calling us names and doing things to cause us problems in work, at home, and in the neighborhood, wherever we may be, because they know where we are constantly. I got a story about that, but it'd be too too long to share it with you right now. But they know you. They know me by name. There is nothing about us that they are confused about. They know that we're children of God. They know that the only thing they can do is verbalize. They can make a loud noise. They can go around like dogs barking and howling and raising a ruckus, but that's all they can do. God, God saves us, keeps us safe in his hands. And so all the, all the howling, barking that the enemy does is, is just, a, just that. It's noise. When does noise ever cause you problems? Unless the decibel level will stand behind a jet airliner, you're, you're not going to be hurt. You're just going to hear a bunch of noise. And that's when we can turn to our Lord and say, Lord, obviously you've got them in derision. You've got them all confused. You've got them upset. Praise God. Hallelujah. All they can do is make a lot of racket again. So I'm just going to praise you, Lord. I'm going to walk in your strength and walk in your spirit. And I'm going to keep praying for their salvation. And Lord, Give them ears to be able to hear your word, Lord. Give them the opportunity, like I had, of getting saved at my darkest and lowest moment when I finally turned to you because your spirit touched me. Do the same thing for them, Lord. Give somebody to them to share the gospel with. Because that's what this whole that's what this whole uh, book is about. That's what this whole psalm is about. It's it's the recognition and the separation between the spirit, spiritual enemy, and the physical enemy. Unfortunately, the uh, the the spiritual here was was only seen as far as the enemy because David wasn't working or walking in the grace and the mercy. He was dealing with the flesh on a daily basis. So we have the opportunity of doing that, of walking in the Spirit. And at evening, let them return and let them make noise like a dog and go around about the city. Oh, yeah, they'll do it, folks. They'll make all the racket they can, but God keeps them at that. It keeps them at bay, keeps them from being able to bite you. They don't. They can't bite you and claw you, but they can make a ruckus and bark at you. Let them wander up and down for meat, and grudge if they have not been satisfied. In other words, they're hungry and they're chomping down, but they're not going to be able to be satisfied no matter what they do. It's not going to meet their soul. They're going to go to bed and they're going to still be grumbling when they're in their bed, fall, trying to fall asleep. You know, one of the things that we can talk to about people. Uh, and share with them about the gospel is that we can ask them, when you go to bed at night, are you s- concerned about what happened during your day? You've got billions of dollars, but are you really satisfied at the end of the night when you're sitting in your in your big uh, fluffy bed? Or is the things of the earth bringing you down and causing you to be confused and wondering what you're going to do tomorrow? You see, because... The bottom line is none of these people have any peace and rest. There is no peace and rest without Christ. There is no peace and rest without the God and our Holy Spirit and our and our Savior who's ministering to us no matter what the situation may be. We can go to bed at night and we can rest knowing that if we wake up in the morning, God will have that day in control. And if we don't wake up in the morning, we're going to have peace forever in heaven. 
It's glorious. Our future is wrapped up in the Holy Spirit. It's in the Holy Spirit. And we have to realize that it's not in the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. We don't have to be concerned with whether we're going to win the mega lotto or not. It's not for us. It's the peace and rest that we have in our God. 16 says, <laughs> but I will sing of thy power. Amen. Glory to God. That's why we have singing in the morning. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. That's why we sing in the morning. That's why we have songs, because why? We're victorious. We have all things under our feet given to us and put there by, by God himself. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Are we in trouble today? Are we having problems today? It's only because we've taken it upon ourselves. It's only because we're allowing it to be a trouble. It's not really a trouble. It's something that we just need to give over to God. God says to give it to him. So why haven't we given it to him? Why are we holding on to things every single day that do nothing but cause us grief and heartache and shame and problems? You know, people people worry about jobs, you know, whether they're going to have a job. And then when 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 all of a sudden they get the offer of a job uh, and they think, oh, boy, I've got a job today. And then they go and take the job interview, but they don't get the job. And then they're all disheartened and crash and, and falling down there thinking, oh, I didn't get the job. I didn't get the job. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but let's grow up a little bit. Sometimes that's not the job that that is meant for us. It's something that the enemy has has tempted us with thinking, oh, this is the best job in the world. I'm going to finally get the thing that's, that means the most for me. Well, folks, what means the most for us? Is it walking in God and just being at peace? Or is it having money and things and stuff all around us? Is that really what makes us happy? Is having a bigger house going to make you happy? When you think about it, all that means is you're going to have more taxes and more things to clean up. And you have to buy more stuff to fill up that house. Sometimes a bigger house is not always the, the thing that's the best for us. Sometimes having a small house meets our needs. It's a place to sleep, place to eat, place to rest, place to re read the Word of God, and a place to just come before him and thank him for the, the things that he has provided for us. In 17, it says, unto thee. Listen to what this says, folks. Unto thee. Oh, my strength, will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Hallelujah. Folks, that's the end. That's, that is the beginning of this psalm, and that's the end of this psalm. Our defense, our strength, everything that we have depends on what? God. It's our, he is our strength, our, our str arms of strength. He is our God. He leads us, guides us, ministers to us, loves us, protects us. He surrounds us with his ministering spirits, like it says in Hebrew chapter 1, verse 13. He makes his angels ministering spirits to minister to his folks. That's to you and I, brother. There is no reason in the world to have any uh, situation today that would prevent us and keep us from saying, praise God, he is victorious over everything. If you haven't said that today, then lift your arms and praise God right now and thank him for all his mercies, all his grace, all his closeness to you. He dwells inside you. He walks with you. He strengthens you. He brings you before the very throne. He ripped the curtain from the in uh, protecting you from the Holy of Holies. He ripped that curtain in half. It was a foot thick, folks. That curtain that separated the Holies from the Holiest of Holies was over a foot thick. 
try ripping a piece of cloth that's over an inch thick, and now try something that's a foot thick. Nobody could rip that. It was designed and made by the by the eyes of God and the the intervention of God and the and the those who were working with the fabric to make that curtain. It was made in such a way that it would never ever fail. It couldn't fail. It had to be literally touched by the hand of God in order to be able to be affected. And so God did it purposefully so that when the priests knew that that nothing could get that through that curtain, what did God do? He reached down and ripped that curtain in half. He tore it asunder and ripped it and, and held it apart so that now everybody could come into the Holy of Holies. That's you. That's me. That's everyone that will give Christ lordship over their lives. He makes a way for us to come into that Holy of Holies. Praise God. Glory. Hallelujah. And if that's not a reason to praise and raise your hands and give glory unto him, then nothing will. You probably need to be saved. So let's recognize within ourselves our weaknesses, but let's give them up. Let's give up those weaknesses, and let's walk strongly in the Spirit of God and give him the glory, the honor that he deserves of being the Lord, the master of our life in everything we do today and tomorrow and the next day and for the rest of our lives. The problem we have is we continually fall back on our own strength today. Let's make a difference today and lean on God's strength every single day. Is that a good place to be? Absolutely. Praise the Lord for his word. Praise the Lord for his ministry. Praise the Lord for his Son, Holy Spirit, and his presence in our lives. Amen. All right, go ahead. Singing, blessed be, blessed be the name, blessed be. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Terry, thank you. I I had I recorded, but I don't know how to stop it. I don't know how I can do that. But anyway, thank you so much, everybody.
Anybody hear me? Yes, thank you so much for your help, Ernie. Thanks for coming in, everybody, y'all.